I've been working at Abbey Road Studios for the last well, nearly 10 years now and came across a concept where we were trying to break apart mono recordings and because of that work I got approached by the Beatles to work on the Hollywood Bowl um, to demix them. So pretty much I'm just going to talk about historically the, the recordings themselves, the background of the actual concerts and then I'll, I'll work my way through what sound source separation is, um, the considerations we need to take when we want to go and demix these audio files, um, the actual techniques, there's multiple techniques available to be used, and then hopefully we get enough time at the end, we'll um, play some audio examples from the actual work that was done. So, the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. 1964, Beatlemania just landed in the United States, and Capitol Records had previously attempted to record their first performances in Washington, which got blocked by the musicians' unions. And that's quite crucial because that played a later part in the actual recordings themselves. So later on in that year, they got all the permissions in place and they decided to record at the Hollywood Bowl, which is a few miles down the road from Capitol's buildings. Um, 15,000 girls turned up and created this wall of sound. So, so, right, okay, just short sample. That was an indication, that's from George um, Martin re-released re these recordings in 1977. And I, when I was first approached to do this project, I grabbed a vinyl record, transferred it digitally so I could play around with the recordings. And it was then I noticed that there's something not right with these recordings at all. And it's not just because the, the, the screams are loud. I went to other concerts of the time that had been recorded. And you listen to the, um, the crowd very, very low in the recordings. And it was this picture here that sort of got me thinking about this, they've done something with their, these recordings. And if you look at the, the speaker, which is below Ringo's drum there, you can just see below the Vox, there's a microphone pushed right up against the speaker. And that's quite common of how they mic'd up um, for sound recordings at the time. Now that mi microphone's pointed directly at the speaker, so it can't pick up the crowd that's come from behind it. No matter what people think, if you need a very, very close source to actually pick up the recordings. I saw that and I thought, well, that has got to be something wrong with these recordings. And so, and the recordings are recorded on a three-track machine. Now, three-track is a format of audio recording where the audio gets laid down in three tracks onto a, in this case, a half-inch tape, which is um, half-inch wide. And they record the vocals on one track instruments on the remaining two tracks and you had bass and drums on one track and you had all the electric guitars and acoustic guitars on the remaining track. And when you listen to the three individual tracks, you've got masses of crowd on the instrument tracks but no crowd on the actual vocal track. Now the vocal track, vocal microphones, open air in the middle of the stage. So they purposely mixed the crowd into the recordings. And we sort of used this information, was then used to actually say, well, let's treat the crowd not as noise, as what it was, but as actually an, as an instrument. So this is caused, in, in a sense, by the, the fact that the concerts were engineered by the Hollywood Bowl engineers. Not the Capitol Studios, actual Hollywood Bowl engineers, because of these um, musician unions in the United States. So all Capital did when they turned up was park their truck in the back, plug the tape machine into the feed and hit record. That's all they could do. So everything on stage, the miking, the actual mixing was done by the in-house engineers. And they were used to a nice, quiet, classical concert in the afternoon by the Hollywood Symphony Orchestra. And they would, to make it sound live, they had microphones in the crowd and they would just turn the microphones up to get the levels to show as a live concert they set up exactly the same 
and did not expect 15,000 screaming girls to turn up. And so they blew out the recordings on those channels. So when they got back into the studio that night and played them back, they'd realized they'd just ruined the entire concerts. Problem was, you would think that the following year, when the rec recordings were done in 1965, they would realize that this same thing happened again. And that's because the engineers were different. They hadn't realized the problems from the previous year. They didn't keep notes. And so the problem happened in 1965 as well. So, so I'm going to show you some images. Here is um, some of the spectral sources. This is an image of the actual one channel of the actual recording, of the stereo recording. And so as you can see, there's no noise there, really. You've got a little bit of noise at the bottom, which is like the noise floor, which you can't really see. But it's actually quite discreet. There's no actual background noise. And when I saw these images, and one of the previous talks was talking about how you can use image recognition, this is an, a physical image recognition of an audio source. So, so the solution we came up was to, we wanted to create a new remix using the um, source separation technology. And basically, that means given the recording of mixture of sound sources, attempt to recover the original sources from the actual um, recording in isolation. In most cases, in modern music, you've got a, a massive multi-track, so you have the isolation of instrumentation. When the Hollywood Bowl was recorded, it's done on three tracks, so it had multiple instruments on, the one, on each individual track. So, problem, using more sources, as I've just said. It's a difficult task, but it's still possible. Various techniques can exist. You had multiple microphone sources, you can use techniques like PCA um, or ICA to actually isolate the individual sources. That works in a convolutive thing. We can assume sources are point, but because this is mixed, we're going to assume it's non-convolutive. So the, the, uh, the sources aren't isolated in space. So why do we use? Because filtering by EQ affects all the entire signal. So if you're trying to soften down the top of the crowd, you're actually topping out the top, softening off the top of the, the cymbal hits or the drums. So you, what you do on the EQ affects the entire signal path, as found by Martin and Emmerich in 1977 when they tr originally tried to reproduce these, um, redo these recordings. So. This is the timeline. So 2009, I started researching source separation. It came around as a, really much as a conversation I had with some of the engineers at Abbey Road. And I said, does any software exist that demixes audio? And they said, they laughed, said, no, that's the holy grail of the recorded music industry. 2000, so at that stage, I started working on some of the original mono recordings. And I was writing all my source code. I'm a software developer by trade. I was writing in C Sharp. And I spent a year and a half writing libraries to do mathematical functions. And did no work at all doing actually research into the idea. That's when I switched to MATLAB, because all the maths is done for you. I can actually concentrate on the problem. And, and that's when I went to the studios. We downloaded the, the trial version, wrote the prototyping code, proved the concept was going to work, and then said to the students, let's do this, we need to go down the, down the road. So 2011, Capital found the original free tracks in their vault in the United States. They send them across to us and say, um, what can we do? I was approached by Giles Martin, who, son of George Martin, because we've been working together on some of the early mono recordings, like She Loves You, um, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, all the original stuff that only exists in mono. And he said to me, can we do anything with source separation to remove the crowd um, from these recordings? And it succeeded by assuming that the actual crowd is signal and not noise. So this work was done late 2011. Early 2012, the, we, the remixes were approved by the board, the board being um, Paul, Ringo, Olivia, and Yoko Ono. And then they sat on them for the next four years, as, as they usually do with um, most of the projects that they work on. It only goes out when the time is right and when things are perfect. So in 2016, Live at the Hollow Bowl got released. Um, 
coincide with the release of the actual theatrical movie, Eight Days a Week. Right. So, sound source separation. We have three main types of sources. We've got vocals, we've got pitched instruments, and then we've got pitched instruments like guitars, it could be um, clarinets, trumpets, anything that uses pitch to actually relay information in terms of sound, and then you've got your per percussive and drums, so that sets the beat and the tonality. No, uh, in, no type of um, s algorithm is optimal for these sources, so we have to use different techniques based on what we're trying to separate out. And as I say here, the more you know about the sources, prior knowledge is useful when we're possible to actually get the information. And in the case of the Hollywood Bowl, because the Beatles are so rock solid in how they made their, their performances, we were able to use the existing multi-tracks of their studio versions as sources to model the sounds. So I was able to take the, what's called the rhythm track, which is usually the bass and the drums and a, an acoustic guitar. I used those to generate the models in MATLAB that I was going to run against the original um, live audio. They, when the Beatles played a song, you could be for certain that would be within one or two seconds each different type of performance. So they were very, very solid in terms of how they performed in the studio and in live. So we've got multi-track sources we can use them to generate models and use those models against the live recordings. And here are some of the results. So I'll try and describe these. It's very hard to try and get these pictures nice and big. So we have, at the bottom, is the extracted bass from the left-hand channel track of the actual recording. So you can see all the energies down the, in the bass frequencies at the bottom of the, of the screen nothing up top, so nice, clean, extracted recording. If we get time at towards the end, we'll um, play some of the results. You'll be able to hear these um, for yourself. On the left-hand side is the actual crowd. That's the crowd on its own. So you can see we've actually removed out the crowd from the signal. This picture here is a breakdown of the one I showed previously. So you saw a spectrogram of all of them combined, and this is the three um, components that make up the, the, um, the signal. And the one on the top right are the drums. And what you'll notice with, in the spectrogram pers perspective with audio is that a percussive signal, a nice, tall, straight peak. So you can see on the right-hand side lots of straight lines all the way through the actual image of the actual spectrogram. So those are the percussive hits of the actual instrumentation. Pitched instruments tend to be drawn out across a spectrogram. So you will see a, a, a guitar strum will go bling like that and then you'll just see it draw across the actual spectrogram. So the crowd is a pitched instrument. It's sitting in the background, it's periodic and it sits across the entire waveform of the actual signal and you can't really see the bass but it just sits across. And the bass line, I think, is just a thump, 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 like that. So we've now, we've now demixed it. So we now need to consider what we're going to do when we go about remixing the actual recordings. So the, the filters are designed to take the three original, in this case, three sources, so that when they recombine, it cancels out or does a, 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 a null cancel of the original source. So we're not into losing any information, we're not adding any information to the signal as well. So what has been separated has come from the actual source signals. Any artifacts that actually do appear, and there are artifacts, if you listen to them really closely, you can actually hear some of the little artifacting, um, similar to um, the auto-tune effect, that is quite famous for most of these things you can't sing anymore. Um, you can actually hear the ringing in the actual Thing, but really low level, it's in like at the minus 60, 70 dB in terms of its signal strength. But it doesn't have to be perfect, because when you put the sources together, the brain is able to put it all back together and you actually hear the sounds properly. Right? Separations don't have to be perfect then, just good enough to impart um, directionality, so you can actually determine 
that's your drums, that's your bass guitar, that's your electric guitar, that's your vocal, and so forth. Right. So, uh, if you push the pan in too far, so you take your drum that was in the middle and you push it all the way out to the right or to the left, then if the, uh, the, it's too far, the integration breaks down and you can start hearing the actual art, artifact within the source. So you've got to take panning position into consideration when you're doing the breakdown. All right, so we've got, once again, no phase issues. The phase is all controlled within the FFT part of the, of the spectrogram. And source drift, source drift in this case is where you have a separation where you, uh, an instrument sticks to, to the same, to moves through the three sources. So you could have a guitar suddenly moving around the stereo image if you try to move them because only parts of the guitar have come out cleanly on one channel and they've been attached to another channel. So basically the source appears to move. When you're listening to it, you can hear, oh, the, the guitar just walked across the stage. So. Drums and percussion, highly localized in time. As I said, if you look at the spectrogram, they're very, very tall and discreet. So we take many approaches. We can use NNMF, non-negative matrix factorization, to decompose the signals into its parts. Um, Dictionary-based methods where you load up a, a, a dictionary of what a drum is supposed to look like or sound like within an actual mix. And then the um, heuristic base, base where you look at, say, I just want the lines for my spectrogram or the, and, and, and pull those out. Heuristics tend to introduce more artifacts. We've pr primarily concentrated on the um, NMF and the dictionary base. The work we've done is actually a combination of them both. In fact, we found that by using the dual approach technique, we can use the same algorithms across more and more similar types of music. It's only when things don't come out correctly, when you're listening to the replays, you think, ah, oh, we need to go back to a more specific model approach. So the same with the vocals and lead instruments. You can use NNMF. Melody tracking, pitch tracking is probably the most common approach at the moment for trying to pull vocals out of a, of a recording mix. Um, companies like Audionamics, and they use a pitch tracking technique um, for Turby pitch tracking. It's a technique that was originally designed to track images through video frames, so they could track a person through a, through a video. Um, and pitch instruments, once again, NMF, um, additive synthesis base, where you actually add in a synthesized version of the, of the signal you're trying to pull out, and then it just looks for the similarities and pulls it out. So it's like a guided approach to source separation. And then the user assisted where we use prior information to aid separation process. So the knowledge of the melody, the, uh, musical scores, backing tracks, and all that type of information can be used to tell the system you know, this is the type of audio we want to use. In the case of the Hollywood Bowl, we're able to use um, existing multi-tracks to create models. So it creates the, the correct temporal image that we're trying to extract. And then we just layer that over top of the so it wrong with. We use that to guide us through the live recordings to pull the actual parts out. So, oh, nearly there. So, different methods work on different types of material. So you'll find that an, an approach will be will work great on vocals on one song, and then the next time it won't work on the vocals. So you need to. It's quite an iterative and subjective process to work out which um, algorithms and techniques work. So we have to pick these based on the song that we're trying to process. So in terms of the Hollywood Bowl, the, we used, we separated all the tracks on the three concerts that were recorded. And there's 18, 24 tracks that were separated. Each individual song got analyzed separately to go through this process and different algorithms were used. So the process of separating out the tracks took two months, two months of work of backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards between Myself, the engineers, Giles Martin, to make sure we've got the actual things working right. And the order that we separate does have an effect on the actual cases. If you're working with um, bass heavy components, so like bass guitar, bass drums, 
um, cellos, anything that's got large components of base information, the order you do that will determine which likelihood where those base components are going to fall to. So sometimes you might have to run the same separation three or four times to work out the optimal way of driving it forward, which really leads on to the next phase of the, the development of the system is we need to look at ways of prototyping and the selection of algorithms and choosing stuff. Um, at the, the code at the moment is pure prototype. There's um, it's a series of, as I said in an interview, it's a series of MATLAB scripts that I then pull out and run against the audio. It'd be nice to actually start to build these into a proper application where the engineer can say, let's try approach one, approach two, and so forth, and moving it forward. That's the next phase of prototyping, which will probably start very soon, and which is why MATLAB is the um, ideal environment at the moment to de de derive and push this forward. Once we're in this nice, stable situation, we can then move to a proper development and, and so forth. Right, so I think this is timing quite nicely. We can open up for some questions soon. So, right, so I'm going to play through some of the um, audio samples at the moment. So we'll, we'll start with the original stereo version that was released by um, EMI in the 1977. And then I'm going to move through the individual tracks. So as I spoke before about it being a three-track recording. So you're going to hear a sample of track one, which was basically the bass, drums, and the crowd all mixed onto the one track. And then I'll step through the extracted drums, extracted bass, and the extracted crowd. And if you listen really, really carefully, you'll hear the, the slight where the extractions are not, they're not perfect, they've never been claimed to be perfect, but you'll hear on the drums, you might hear a bit of the crowd, just a little bit, just a little bit of the crowd and the thing, and same thing when you get to the crowd, you might hear a fraction of the actual drums themselves, and that's mainly due to how the percussive components are extracted. Sometimes a pitch instrument has that little hit at the very, very start, so when you strum a guitar, the very, very first hit is like a, a, sna a hit on the snare drum. So we'll just move through these, and so here's the original stereo. From last year, it's called She Loves You. <laughs> So that's the um, that was the that was got was released. It's I think it's quite listenable at the time. Um, though there's a lot going on with high frequencies where they've tried to try and soften the crowd. So we'll now listen to the original track one from the recording. <laughs> So you didn't hear any of the vocal there, did you? It's the same section of the song, no vocals were heard. And now we move through the drums, and this is taken through where the drums were actually more prevalent, so. Yeah, and just here, the top of the crowd, at the very, where, the, where the cymbals are hitting. I'll just finish these, then we can, I'll open up for questions in a few seconds. So, bass is it's the same section again. Boom. It's killing their sound system over there. And then finally the extracted crowd. Right, and can just hear the tops of the guitar or the drums inside those as well. And I think that is the end. <laughs> 